Hello everyone. Greetings from Bangkok. I'm Gritya Kavivong, an artistic director of the Jim Thompson Art Center and a guest curator of the exhibition People, Victory, Life After the War, which I co-curated with the students from the Embassy International School and the Renaissance. Welcome to the last editions of our online lecture series, a public program of the two chapter exhibition of modern and contemporary art from Vietnam from the Nguyen Art Foundation. I would like to thank Queen Nguyen, the foundation founder, for inviting me to curate this show from Thailand. So this is my first time doing this remotely during the COVID period. Today is a great pleasure to host this lecture from ethnography to the archive researching contemporary Vietnamese art by Professor Nora Taylor from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, or SAIC. In this talk, Professor Nora Taylor intended to provide an introduction to Vietnamese art from the colonial period to the present, and she will focus on the ways in which art has been studied and researched since the open door policy known as the Doi Mui. And rather than being comprehensive, the talk will focus on the important figures who have contributed to the development of contemporary art and artistic ideas in Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh City, and the diaspora. Professor Nora Teller is a professor of South and Southeast Asian art at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. She is author of Painters in Hanoi, an ethnography of Vietnamese art printed by Hawaii in 2004 and reprinted by Singapore Press in 2009. Modern and Contemporary Southeast Asian Art and Anthology printed by Cornell SEAP Press in 2012, and numerous articles on modern and contemporary art from Southeast Asia and Vietnam. And she also curated two exhibitions, Changing Identities, Recent Works by Women Artists from Vietnam in 2008, and 12,759.3, Breeding is Free, Recent Works by Jun Nguyen Hasichuba in 2010 at SAIC. And currently, Professor Teller is Fulbright University's Distinguished Visiting Scholars for the 2020 academic years, and she is now living in Ho Chi Minh City. I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and if you have questions, please feel free to write down on Facebook or send it directly to the staff. And thanks everyone for attending this talk, and please join me in welcoming Professor Nora Teller. Hello everyone, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Gritya Gawi Wong for those kind words of introduction. Thank you, Bill, as well. And thanks to the Nguyen Art Foundation for in inviting me today. So my presentation today is uh, really an overview, not so much uh, about Vietnamese art, but also about how we go about researching Vietnamese art. And uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a background of myself, but also why I, I'm choosing to speak about this, um, because it's really a process of reflection, in a way, of three decades now of researching Vietnamese art. And when I first started researching this topic, I was uh, happened to, I, well, for, for various reasons, uh, I became interested in the topic, but I really wanted to um, explore as much as possible about Vietnamese art and really relied on chance and uh, allowed uh, people to come to me rather than me go to them. Uh, and I had to process uh, how I was researching only after the fact. And in fact, three decades later, I'm still kind of processing what I exactly I researched. But I came to Vietnam in 1992, and I uh, did something which uh, in anthropology is called hanging out, or in Vietnamese, choi, with artists, um, meaning that I most of the time I met with artists, I didn't just interview them, in fact, I hardly interviewed them at all. I mostly just hung out with them and listened to them and heard their stories and talked to them. But I also 
observed uh, and looked at how they lived, how they made their art, and what was the context in which they made their work. And this is the anthropologist Clifford Geertz actually thought this was the best way to go about researching something. And uh, I was often made fun of that uh, for, for adopting this research, which I eventually called ethnographic, um, which then became the subtitle of the book that I published, Painters in Hanoi. I called it an ethnography in order to pay homage to this method, uh, uh, this anthropological method of researching uh, art and culture. Um, but then I also became kind of critical of that because I wasn't sure that it was exactly an ethnography because it sounded like I was too distant from my subject or that I was positioning myself as an outsider, when in fact I felt very much like an insider. But then this was given validation to me just this year, as uh, many of you might know, that the uh, collective, uh, artist collective from Indonesia named Ruang Rupa are the curators of arguably the largest contemporary art, uh, or, and most important one, contemporary art event in Europe, Documenta, that takes place every five years. And the Indonesian collective called their curatorial platform Lumbung, which is actually another way of describing hanging out. And they, they describe the Lumbung as a kind of um, a site, also a space of collectivity, but also of interaction. And so for me, it means that my, my method of research kind of got some validation, but then I realized that also it is how Vietnamese artists live. So I was not just experiencing this kind of thing myself, but uh, hanging out is really the method also of making art in Vietnam. So I'm going to, today I'm just going to talk a little bit about how these two ideas interact with one another. Uh, in other words, it's not just how I went about researching something, but it is also about how the art, art is made in, with these ideas in mind. So in the 1990s, I came to Vietnam when there really weren't any art galleries. Uh, there were plenty of artists, but it was very difficult to find them if you didn't know someone. So you had, you had to do a lot of detective work, and people gave me names of people and et cetera. Uh, which is also a kind of ethnographic research. Uh, but when tourists started coming uh, to Hanoi in the 90s, you would see signs like this saying art here uh, around, you know, or this is art. And it uh, became kind of amusing for me to see uh, how outsiders did come and encounter art, not necessarily by chance, but where the artist put it. And um, the first galleries uh, that opened up in Hanoi in the 90s were more like shops. So uh, showed um, or displayed antiques uh, a alongside paintings. And uh, for outside visitors, it probably was difficult to distinguish one artist from the other. And so when I talk to people, uh, international people or colleagues <clears throat> in the States who are art historians, they often question how I can possibly make sense of an art ecology, an art community, through this method of hanging out. Uh, how can you tell the difference between one artist and another? Who are the important artists? And many uh, uh, art historians were applying a particular framework or a particular lens onto the Vietnamese art scene. And I was very stubborn. I refused to apply that. So I really let things appear to me so that I wasn't imposing any kind of prejudice or view onto what was happening in Vietnam. But still, I needed some sort of framework. The most basic framework for writing art history is history itself. In other words, a chronology. You have to start with a period of time and an origin or a beginning. So I chose for my beginning uh, the Chung Dai Hak Mithuat Hanoi, or the uh, Hanoi Art School, which I uh, visited and uh, also kind of immersed myself in, spent a lot of time uh, 
uh, hanging out with the students and looking and observing how they were studying uh, art. Now, how is this historical if this is in the present tense? Uh, it's historical because, of course, this school is the same one that was built in 1925 um, by the uh, French artist Victor Tardieu and his uh, Vietnamese collaborator uh, Nguyen Nam Son, and the, it is still located in the same building. So these kind of um, what I would call anachronistic chance encounters were very valuable to me. In other words, I was walking perhaps back in time or I was questioning whether I was actually in the present moment uh, or how was I going to uh, articulate all of this in writing was another challenge I had. But I still keep keeping in mind that there's this duality of both my method of research, in other words, obtaining information, is also aligned with how artists lived. So I would meet artists who uh, maybe had studied at the colonial art school um, and in the present moment still continued to make paintings, but did not have studios, they did not have exhibitions, um, their works were hard, difficult to see outside of their own home. And their homes were very small. Um, this is Mai Van Hien, who graduated from the Hanoi Art School in 1944. Um, didn't spend much time there because the school closed in 1945. And he kept uh, all of his works in his one-room house that he shared with his wife and two daughters when they were younger. He now lived there alone as a widow. But hanging out with him gave me the opportunity to learn everything orally. Um, nothing was written about him. He just told me his stories. And, uh, and then also, uh, not only is meeting him and listening to him the way I obtained information about him and his biography, which are also valuable methods of writing art historical research. But I realized the subject of his paintings also had to do with encountering people and meeting people. And uh, this is one of his most famous paintings um, that uh, is in the, in the Museum of Fine Arts. There aren't many uh, of his uh, paintings in the museum. But this is uh, an encounter between uh, a soldier and a woman who is helping him out, or they are meeting Gap Niao in Vietnamese on the trail towards um, the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. And these are women that would bring um, uh, goods, food, um, and just provide assistance uh, to the soldiers. And he told me that he really liked this these encounters as he himself was at Dien Bien Phu and uh, thought that there maybe could be an intimate connection between a soldier and a woman that they would meet. So he would tell me in this voice, like, perhaps they might fall in love. And so what appears to be a very um, patriotic portrait of soldiers on their way to Dien Bien Phu Listening him, to him tell the story as something like a romantic encounter, of course, changes your perception of the painting. So these were very valuable uh, tools for me to be able to hear the artist's voice. And nowhere is it written in an art history book that that's the subject of the painting. Um, I was in Hanoi in 1994 when there was a celebration of the 40th anniversary since the, end, since the victory at Dien Bien Phu. And it was also an occasion for the French president to come to uh, Vietnam for the first time since uh, 1975. And uh, so I wrote an article for a uh, local English language newspaper about my Ben Hien and other artists who uh, were at Dien Bien Phu. And so again, what may seem like a very patriotic version of this story, that these are artists that sketched, of course, a victory and were very patriotic. I put my Van Hien's uh, drawing on the, uh, uh, in the article um, 
to showcase his observational skills and his sort of existing on the sidelines of a, of a battle, but him viewing the war so as an artist. And so similar to, to him, here I was also kind of witnessing uh, how things uh, were taking place and I was witnessing the anniversary of the, of the war and the victory and writing about it. And when I wrote this article, a lot of people saw it and they thought, okay, maybe I was doing something useful as a researcher because before that they weren't quite sure what I was doing if I was just hanging out with artists. Um, so Mai Van Hien became a really interesting source for me for learning about the role of artists in the shaping of the nation, the role of artists in uh, capturing uh, certain nationalist concepts. He drew uh, money. Uh, he uh, followed uh, Ho Chi Minh uh, and he sketched Ho Chi Minh. So he also shaped kind of this image uh, that one has of uh, Ho Chi Minh uh, in his sandals uh, sitting on, on a rock uh, and his camaraderie uh, with people. Um, so he also um, uh, knew Tong Ok Van, who also established the art school after 1945 in Viet Bac. And so here are just some images to remind you of um, the role that uh, Tong Ok Van played in uh, moving the school uh, from a colonial art academy into an art school that had purpose, that, had, that would create artists that captured the nation. And uh, some of these, of course, works are in this exhibition here, um, so I don't need to go into great detail. But to hear an artist, uh, from an artist uh, who was there, and he could tell me these stories in very emotional and personal terms um, was also very interesting for me. So I would, of course, me hanging out with the artist, as I said before, is, uh, is also capturing the way that other artists lived and interacted with one another. Because in the period um, between 54 and 75, especially in Hanoi, um, when uh, artists didn't necessarily have spaces to show their work, uh, there, there were not that many exhibitions. Uh, it was difficult to earn a living as an artist. Uh, artists hung out with each other, especially in cafes. And Hanoi, of course, is the city of cafes. There are cafes everywhere. This is how people uh, meet each other, uh, how they, where they talk, where they gather. And um, so I learned quickly about uh, Lam, Nguyen Van Lam, uh, who was a cafe owner and often uh, collected the works of the artists who came to his cafe or traded his uh, coffee for, for artworks and for sketches. It became a site where artists hung out and, and sketched. So there were famous paintings such as Nguyen Sang's portrait of Lam himself and Bui Sun Phai um, sitting at a table and the price of coffee behind them. And then I met uh, Lum uh, in 1993 and talked to him about his collection and what he collected. And he too uh, encountered many of these artists by chance. And so this idea that a Vietnamese art history is kind of written by chance encounters or is written by a community of artists who are hanging out with each other, again, adds to this um, lens with which I was beginning to view Vietnamese art and thinking that this is a very different kind of art history that gets written than the one that I had studied when I was in university. And so Lam uh, told me uh, a little bit about you know, the works that he collected, but not so much the, the works, but more the people. And uh, when I wrote my book or my dissertation, Painters in Hanoi, I focused a lot on the people more than the paintings. For which again, some 
scholars may find fault and say, you know, you don't write enough about paintings. Where is the, your interpretation of the paintings? And I spent much more time talking about this community that I observed of uh, people gathering, but also individual figures who really shaped Vietnamese art history. And they shaped Vietnamese art history because of their contributions, of course, both as artists, but also as collectors. And uh, Lum made uh, that contribution because he supported artists when they did not have means of support. And uh, the artists that he supported were artists that were not necessarily supported by the state or by the uh, art association uh, in, in Hanoi. So in, when I started researching in 1992, I was receiving two different kinds of stories. I was receiving stories from someone like Lum or even Mai Van Hien about, um, sorry, well, Lum probably uh, and other artists uh, about the artists that didn't make it into the catalogs and books that I did find. So even though I did conduct a kind of ethnography of Vietnamese art because there were no books about Vietnamese art, there were some catalogs of exhibitions, but they, were, they didn't include the artists that the artists that I met talked about. So everybody talked about Nguyen Sang, they talked about Bui Xuân Phai, but those were not in the books that I saw in the shops. Um, so I really needed to understand this two dual history and uh, so I began to research why these artists were not in those books and also understand why they were talked about by these other artists. So that became a kind of complex picture of um, Vietnamese art in the 1980s. And so I began to analyze that as something that reflected more the time period that I was in, the 90s, rather than the 80s, because I was trying to understand things in the present tense. So to understand things in the 90s was actually to understand what was available in the 90s and what was not necessarily going back to the 1980s. Because if I had, could teletransport myself to the 1980s in Hanoi, I wouldn't have seen these artists in state exhibitions, but I would have found them in the cafes. So this is how I would began to understand the, the figures, the celebrated figures in the 90s, um, but they were not celebrated in the 80s. So they were really only sort of rediscovered after their death in the 90s. So this is how the work of an art historian is, to make sense of who, uh, who appears in, in these stories and these narratives of art history. So um, the modernist Nguyen Sang, who did have works though in the museum, but the works that he had in the museum were not the same kinds of works that people talked about. But people talked about him as a modernist and someone who really shaped uh, Vietnamese modernism, but then the works that he had in the museum were more along the lines of something that is more nationalistic or patriotic, um, although he also uh, was subject to some sort of um, critical attention at one point uh, or another. Now, the 90s, to, to, to go back to the 90s where I was, was also a time when there had been the first exhibition of Vietnamese painting outside of Vietnam since 1975, let's say, in Hong Kong, an exhibition called Uncorked Soul. And the book or the catalog of that exhibition was available in, in Hanoi at certain people's houses, not in the bookstores. And that book really made a difference in the 90s about how people perceived what outsiders were paying attention to in Vietnamese art. So a gallery in Hong Kong, Plum Blossoms, had sent a journalist to kind of uh, uh, investigate what was available in Vietnam because he had exhibited uh, Chinese artists in Hong Kong from the 90s and was very interested in what was perhaps forbidden. So he shaped this perception of a kind of dual um, uh, community of Vietnamese artists and that 
the artists who had been neglected in the 80s were really to be valued. So this, this exhibition made that impression on people and had a big impact in the 1990s of how art continued to evolve. Now, of course, Buisson Phi is uh, uh, you know, a, a wonderful artist to uh, explore uh, for his style and unique uh, style. But also, it's interesting to understand his position within this community uh, of artists and how, how art history gets written as well. So um, I, it was also very difficult to find his works um, in the 90s. There were collectors interested in him, but many of the works that appeared on, on the burgeoning market were reproductions. And there, were, there was a lot of gossip and discussion about the genuine fies versus the uh, reproductions. But, um, so I didn't really see a lot of genuine fies um, unless I talked to people who actually had them in their houses. And uh, I w again, listening to how people talked about Phi, they would talk about him as someone who was uh, uh, very poor, someone who um, uh, spent a lot of time in cafes, someone who loved Hanoi, and that all of his paintings showed this love of Hanoi that he had. Of course, by then, <clears throat> I also loved Hanoi, so I definitely uh, had this uh, romantic idea about him uh, as well. And he also sketched a lot of portraits of his friends. And this also illustrates how friendship and camaraderie and just hanging out in cafes also is what nurtures uh, Vietnamese art. And uh, hundreds and hundreds of his small, very small portraits were exhibited in the gallery in Hanoi uh, for the first time in 1993, I believe. And I went to the exhibition, and there were drawings that as, were as small as a little tiny stamp, almost, of all of the portraits that he had made um, of, his, uh, of his friends, many of whom actually came to the exhibition. So I could kind of match the portraits with the real people, which was uh, very exciting as an art historian. So I, you know, to bring in again Lum, uh, he did a portrait of Lum. He did spend a lot of time in Cafe Lum, and he was also collected by uh, one of the names that surfaced uh, as I was researching Vietnamese art as. Um, an important art collector uh, before 1940, uh, before 1954, um, the artist, uh, the art collector Duc Minh, um, and he, uh, his collection uh, was, I don't have to go into a longer story, but uh, split up between his family members. Some of the collection is actually here in Saigon, um, but people talked about him as someone who really also helped to uh, nurture and foster the development of uh, Vietnamese art. And um, here he is uh, with uh, the other of the modernist, Vietnamese modernist, Zung Bic Lien, and Zung Bic Lien's nephew, who owns a lot of uh, his paintings, also introduced me to some of the works in his house, and here he is with my Van Hien. So just to show you these kinds of encounters that I had in researching Vietnamese art. I also met the uh, fourth person um, who was considered the Vietnamese modernist, Nguyen Tung Nhiem, who survived uh, out or outlived uh, his three other uh, contemporaries by uh, decades, um, and his, uh, in his home in 1993. So Nguyen Sang, um, Bui Xuân Phai, um, Zung Bic Lien, and uh, Nguyen Tu Nhiem were the four names that people discussed over and over again as the, the Vietnamese modernists. So here are some of the works that I was able to see in his home, but also um, that are available. So the other place where um, art was kind of happening in uh, spaces where artists would gather, 
and where I could also obtain a lot of information and research was in a space called Salon Natasha, which was uh, founded by uh, a Russian woman uh, and her husband, Wu Zentan, and in his home in Hanoi. So just to make the, the, the connections, here's a photograph of Wu Zentan and Wu Sun Fai, and then a photograph also of Wu Zentan and Natasha's wedding in 1985, and seated next to Natasha is also Chen Zintung, who's a, a translator and writer whom I met, who also uh, greeted and welcomed many people into his home and uh, also created a kind of salon where I was able to go and, and meet artists and talk about Vietnamese art as well. But Salon Natasha really captures this spirit of collective art making in that Wu Zentan turned his home into an art space into a kind of giant studio, or not giant, so not so giant, but a studio where anything was possible and artists could come and create works um, freely and experiment. And it, he created that space and nurtured that space. And anybody could come in, um, but mostly it was his friends. And um, uh, the, because it was his home, um, it wasn't necessarily identified as an art space. And he also became a figure that was difficult to write into Vietnamese art history. So I had to also kind of find, figure out a way to include him in um, my study. And originally I did not include him because he seemed like such an outsider. And, and I re began to realize my own prejudices or biases over who is an insider, who is an outsider, who is actually an important artist, who is not an important artist, trying very hard not to make those selections. But as in the case with um, Bui Sun Fai and uh, others, it seemed like I was listening to what people were telling me and I relied perhaps sometimes too heavily on what other people were telling me. And a lot of people were dismissive of Wu Zentan's legacy. And uh, so there was some also contradictory information about him. But after his uh, death, um, uh, his widow, uh, Natasha, continued the spirit of the space and always opened, you could go uh, on at 30 Hang Bong Street and walk by and the door would always be open from nine in the morning until nine at night. And people could come in and just sort of witness the legacy of Wu Zentan. His works were on the wall, but there might be actually someone else there, another artist visiting or someone actually making work as well. And in the in the 90s, when, uh, when he was still alive and uh, had the salon that organized various events, and uh, uh, he, uh, he was always present in the space, uh, but facilitated these kind of chance uh, happenings, uh, performances, um, workshops. Uh, uh, he was a kind of a Dadaist, uh, so he also believed in this idea of chance encounters, and, but was a, a, a ter terrific artist in his own right that also had wanted to uh, explore all kinds of materials and mediums and really does not fit into uh, the trajectory of other artists in Vietnam for that reason. He used recycled and reclaimed material. He had a very keen sense, acute sense of humor. It plays on words. Um, he had a, 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 a critical, he was also very critical of certain aspects of, for instance, uh, consumerism in Vietnam, but then he also had a critical uh, notion of uh, uh, socialism as well. So he was really uh, individualistic. So here are works that he made out of cigarette boxes, um, playing on these words, reincarnation. The cigarette boxes are also have sketches of women. He would uh, kind of rip off of um, the names of the 
cigarette brands, for instance. Um, he gave these cigarette boxes wings, but then they looked like insects too in a box. So really you could uh, interpret these uh, works in, in multiple ways, but they're really about uh, find, found objects um, and him really believing that art is, should be free, uh, a free expression of whatever you happen to be thinking about. So that in that way, he really was a Dadaist. So these kinds of ways of looking at, um, or these spaces for art were very different from the official spaces. And by official spaces, I mean the uh, uh, sanctioned sort of art association spaces, um, where I went quite frequently at 16 O'Krean Street to attend exhibition openings and I uh, would meet artists there too, and uh, our, uh, teachers at the art school would come to 16 Old Korean Street. Um, and this is where I also understood the difference between an exhibition space like this and uh, Salon Natasha, and how they don't really have anything in common. Um, these are spaces for artists that um, uh, paint national subjects or uh, whose work are um, made by artists who went to the art school, whose then was self-taught. Um, so there were uh, really opposite kinds of, of spaces and they had opposite kinds of uh, events and ceremonies and different kinds of culture. Here there's a very official opening with a cutting of a ribbon Huzentan would not have that. It would be much more um, free and there would be music or poetry read and so forth. So trying to make sense of what exactly is Vietnamese art history under Doi Moi is something that I had also been writing about. And I was also very interested in who writes Vietnamese art history in Vietnam. Um, and the art historian Nguyen Quan and Phan Cam Tung were two that I met who had rec fairly recently, that is uh, prior to my arrival in the 90s, late 80s, wrote a book called uh, Vietnamese, or Art of the Vietnamese People. And they were explaining to me that they believe that Vietnamese art, and modern art especially, had its origins in the village. And that, that uh, all, artists, and they're telling me this in the 1990s, that all artists owe their vocabulary and spirit from the village. And so I, I visited a lot of villages uh, around Hanoi, and of course the concept of a village communal house embodies this idea of collectivity that now Rang Rupa and Documenta is going to be celebrating. Which is the idea of a communal house is that in the village everybody comes and then there are various events that bring the village together. There's an altar to the ancestors of the village and so forth. So that it, it, to think of modern art coming from this concept uh, only further reinforces this idea that collectivity and also hanging out and group ethics is really what is shaping uh, modern art. And this is, of course, debatable. But Nguyen Quan himself was, you know, he believed in this idea as an, as an art, art, art historian. But as an artist, he was also much more interested in surrealism and um, he, uh, you know, in European modernism. But uh, there, he really ca grabbed onto this idea of surrealism, but in a very different way from Buzentan. For him, surrealism in painting was what interested him free forms or kind of odd juxtapositions of uh, different things uh, uh, simultaneously on the canvas, such as uh, you know, a soldier next to a table and a still life. These are very uncanny uh, uh, objects put together for no real reason. So it is very difficult to interpret his paintings other than that. And he didn't want you to really look very deeply into his paintings. They were just form. And he tried to make a painting that was much more patriotic, and this is the 
it's called the flag on Dien Bien Phu, but really it's very hard to see the content of this painting as much as the form. So you see the lines, the diagonal lines going into the background and many of the faces are blurred. So, he, so this kind of heralded a, a, a new idea about art, that it was not so much about the people, like I, I mentioned before, or the communities, or it's, but it's also trying to create painting that really had no content almost, that it was getting towards abstraction. So these are the, the works that he made in the 1990s. He was very prolific, and uh, like many of the artists I met in the 90s, they were constantly painting. They managed to get some, a lot of material, a lot of oils, and they were really painting a lot. So these were all um, surrealist, and there was a, a biography of Salvador Dali that was on sale um, uh, in the 90s. So I can see why he was inspired by Salvador Dali. You can see these kinds of busts of women or uh, bodies that look like statues rather than flesh. Um, and then uh, in 1993, he introduced me to uh, a group of artists, of five artists, and at the house of Chen Zuntung. And uh, Zuntung said out loud, yes, here we go, the Gang of Five. So this is the Gang of, he named them the Gang of Five. And so I wrote about them in uh, the uh, Vietnam, Vietnam Investment Review um, and their exhibition because thanks mostly to what Nguyen Quan was saying. So again, relying on what people were saying about the Gang of Five, that they were really the up and coming generation of artists. They were the legacy of Bui Xuân Phai. They were making abstract works. Or they were making works that had this um, modernist uh, look to them. Um, they used oil paints, and these were far from patriotic subjects. It was much more personal subjects, portraits, um, still lives. Um, these were subjects that had nothing to do with the uh, battles of Dien Bien Phu or the uh, soldiers uh, uh, or patriotic themes. And, um, but it was interesting to me because when I talked to them um, about their works, very often they would tell me that their works were actually very Vietnamese. So I was trying to figure out, okay, what does that mean to be very Vietnamese? And is it like Nguyen Quan says that all of these works actually go back to a spirit of the village? And uh, when I listened to Chen Lung talk about his paintings that were paintings of underwater creatures, he did very much talk about the village, that when he was little, he went to the countryside or to a village and he would look into the ponds. So that was a question for me, but I didn't want to kind of label all of this work as of course related to the village, but it became a kind of lens or a method through, by which I would hear someone like Nguyen Quan speak about art and begin to try to uh, put pieces together. So um, Chen Lung um, departed from painting after a while and uh, co-founded an art space, uh, Nha San, um, where experimentation and performances took place and so forth, and so there was a a different direction that Vietnamese art was taking after the 1990s. So we're moving into the 2000s. I was no longer living in Vietnam, so I didn't witness a lot of things myself. So I had to rely on other sources to obtain information about Vietnamese art, except for when I would come back periodically. And But 2000 is also an era when the internet started uh, arriving or people were taking more pictures. And so I was able to get a lot more information through, um, through the, those sources, through the internet or through what people sent to me. Um, so this, and then I was able to, for instance, witness one of Chen Lung's performances in Seoul in 2008. So Chen Lung is one of the artists of the Gang of Five. The other is Ha Chi Hu. Who, can, who also painted themes related to the village, but in very abstract uh, forms and very abstract ways, and continues to kind of source uh, subjects for his paintings from village themes. Um, Hong Viet Zung uh, painted uh, not village themes, but portraits of uh, 
of uh, uh, children, young people, landscapes, and so forth. So, uh, still, I'm kind of continuing on this theme of collectivity and um, friendships and hanging out. So that was one group, the Gang of Five, and then they kind of branched out. Um, but then the important collective, of course, that's going to be part of the exhibition documenta is Nyasan. And the, this is also like Salon Natasha, a space, but also people who inhabit that space, who use that space uh, for creativity, for performances, for art events, and kind of has its own identity as an, uh, a, a kind of art making platform. And uh, so they, after they had a physical space, Anyasan, they became a kind of more nomadic space, but maintaining their identity as a collective, which is exactly what they will be representing at the Documenta event. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm aware that I'm showing a lot of material um, and we don't have m that much time, but these are some of the works that are created by members of the Nyasan Collective and um, uh, very different works than what I encountered in the 1990s. Much more experimental performance works, uh, works with different material, unlike the paintings that were really the dominant uh, art form and the art medium in the 1990s. And uh, I also uh, noticed a lot of discrepancies. Um, there were mostly men that uh, were shaped the art world in the 1990s. When I was uh, interviewing artists, there were mostly men. And I began to notice that there, were, there was an absence of women. And, but after 2000, I started meeting women, and they were doing much more experimental work, like Lee Huang Li here. Uh, I was able to invite her to an exhibition that I curated in the United States of 10 women artists from Vietnam. And this is her performing at Mills College in 2007. And she had, I, I had become familiar with her work uh, in this piece called Monument to Round Trey. Nguyen Hui An, uh, who also was uh, used materials in his performances uh, using charcoal. It's also a very interesting um, method of making performance. So I shifted my research to um, focus for a while, for about five or six years, I focused almost exclusively on performance art in Vietnam because I began to see that this was really the art form that artists were embracing uh, to break away from the 1990s and break away from the emphasis on painting. And, and if you can trace kind of trajectories or continuity between one period of art history to another, you can see that this is the logical kind of outgrowth from places like Salon Tasha or Nyasan that, uh, or even you could argue the group of artists like Wisun Phai and Gang of Five who made art collectively or influenced each other by um, forming groups and hanging out with each other. So these are some of the performance works that took place at uh, Nyasan. Some of them I witnessed myself, but some of them uh, uh, I was given photographs of, and um, uh, I wrote, tried to write about the performance works that I witnessed myself, but it was not easy to always be in Vietnam at the right time. And uh, uh, I also, um, realized, as I said, that there were gaps in the narratives of uh, Vietnamese art. So I couldn't, because I couldn't um, capture all of the performance works, I kind of stopped researching performance art after a while because I just wasn't around to witness it so much. So I've been doing a lot more kind of retrospective uh, reflection on, on some things that I might have missed. Uh, when I was doing my research. So one of the things that I focused on, as I mentioned before, was gender and women artists, because I really realized that I had not spent quite so much time on them. Even though there's a chapter of my book on women artists, um, uh, 
the to put them in a separate chapter was might be a mistake because it made it seem like they were apart. But it was also how I witnessed um, artists living and working in the 90s is that often the women were not sharing the same spaces as the men. They were often apart and separate from the men. Um, but then recently there's been recognition of some of these artists too. So Nunti Monbik, I had met her um, frequently and so she also was part of my book, but I had a hard time inserting them, her into the narrative. But recently she was given a show at the age of 90 at L'Espace in Hanoi, um, a retrospective of her work. So she's you know, getting recognition now uh, for a lot of the work that she made in the um, 60s, 70s, but also in the 90s. Um, she made a lot of portraits, paintings on silk. And uh, here she is at the opening of her exhibition in 2020 at L'Espace. Um, and she still uh, paints and she lives in a village in Hien Van outside of Hanoi. The other artist who I was interested in as so, sort of uh, standing in for a kind of feminist artist in the 1990s, I, I imagined, because when I met her, she also spoke about um, being uh, a little bit rebellious against the ways in which uh, women or the female figure was uh, portrayed in painting. And that she made a series of black and white portraits of uh, women that look like children's drawings or stick figures and they're only in black and white. Um, so I was very intrigued by this reaction that she had to how the figure was painted and uh, wrote a little bit about her as this um, sort of feminist kind of artist. Um, and then Another artist who uh, I became to know uh, in 2004, only when I returned to Vietnam, because she had just graduated from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where I now happen to be teaching. And she uh, impressed me because she came uh, away from, or graduated from a very experimental art school in America but still used uh, a Vietnamese medium of paper in her work. Um, she uh, has been making work for, um, since then, since 2000 work, almost exclusively in paper, and makes all kinds of experiments with paper. And she also doesn't really fit into uh, mainstream uh, Vietnamese art because of her experimentation with material and with medium. And, no subject matter. So they're really uh, spontaneous doodles, drawings um, that look, sometimes they're very small, like the ones here, miniature, um, just dots of ink on paper. Uh, sometimes she's, they're abstract forms of the city. She tries to make lamps where light comes through. Uh, she's really exploring the medium of paper in all of its facets and uh, uh, traveled the world in residencies where paper making, for instance, in Japan is the craft of that place and uh, she doesn't care if she, her work doesn't fit into what is currently on view or currently in vogue at various uh, exhibitions or contemporary art events. And the other person who is really exploring uh, medium is uh, uh, Wen Fifi, -fi, who's exploring the medium of lacquer. And she too sees uh, medium kind of as form, that she's exploring the material itself of lacquer more than it as an, uh, a medium for representation. It's really the material itself that she's interested in. So she's done all kinds of works that, um, for instance, in this work she puts lacquer on a glass uh, frame and then uh, projects it, projects it uh, on, against the wall and so you can really see through. She talks about lacquer as something like skin. So it's layered, the layers of lacquer that are required and the hard work uh, to, to make the, uh, the work kind of appear um, is 
you know, a, a, almost like a metaphor. So these are kind of the, the different artists that um, I've been interested in uh, lately. But I've also been interested, again, in this method of uh, researching art history in archives and artists that uh, make artworks about history. So it's, you know, there are really no archives of uh, Vietnamese art in Vietnam, but I started to work with an organization in Hong Kong called Asia Art Archive, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But I was interested in how, I'm also interested in artists who look back in time and think about history in their own work. And this started when I visited Din Kule's piece at Documenta, the two documentas ago, so 10 years ago, where he uh, exhibited uh, drawings uh, by artists dur during the war um, and created an installation that is really his own. Um, so he, as a contemporary artist, is kind of using, uh, or not using is not the right word, but show showcasing works of previous artists in order to try to uh, understand uh, their voice or speaking about them and kind of becoming a kind of facilitator uh, to draw attention to what he considered is a kind of lost or forgot forgotten period of history. And so this interested me. I wrote about this uh, work. Uh, it interested me a lot because of this project that I had uh, started with Natasha um, where we created a digital archive of, called the Central Natasha Archive for Asia Archive. Now, what is a digital archive? Uh, it means that we're not collecting actual objects or documents uh, and putting them in a display case or in a library, but rather we hired someone to scan all of the material and then we organized it on a website by category, by year. This is a two, was a two-year project. So we scanned 8,000 objects and then created what Asia Archive called a tree, where it had events, years, types of artworks, types of events, exhibitions, happenings, all kinds of things. And uh, you could click on an artist, or you click on a year, and then it would open up folders. So kind of simulating the idea of an archive as a repository of documents. These are folders, and inside the folder is material, and you get to view, and you click on the views, and you see it. So it's a research tool, really. Um, but it really captures something. In the process of making this archive over two years, we realized it really captured uh, a time period that I, even as a researcher, had completely neglected in my own work. So the archive is a new kind of platform for showcasing art history. And now future generations of art historians actually have something that they can write about. But it's not so much the tool to obtain information. It is a kind of art history in itself. It's, it's already there. It's, it tells a story. It shows the images of artists. It has the voices of the artists. It tells you how much, for instance, certain artworks sold. It shows Wu Zentan's scribbles and script. It has photographs of people at, at openings. So you can almost kind of live that period um, in exploring the archive. You can kind of immerse yourself in that moment, um, which is something that an art historical text cannot do, in, a sen in essence. And I also became interested in an artist who is also mining history for his work, a Danish uh, Vietnamese artist named uh, Zan Bal, who uh, grew up in Denmark, but has been collecting historical artifacts and exhibiting them as artworks. So this is kind of the thread of the, the research that I've been doing recently is that how, this question of what, what happens when you use a historical object and turn it into contemporary art. Are you drawing the viewer into that period or are you making a critical comment about that period or are you, uh, uh, you know, asking yourself questions about the value of history 
or what is remembered, what is forgotten. And uh, he also sees sort of uh, historical objects as having their own aesthetic and their own beauty. Um, and so they're, they're not just historical objects for them. They can be viewed in the present tense, in the present moment. So these are contemporary art objects, even though they're ancient. And so that aligns with how I perceived uh, Din Kule's project as well. And then another uh, artist I wrote about, um, Fan Tangren's Voyage de Rode, also is interested in history. And she uh, bought on um, eBay uh, a copy of uh, Alexandre de Rode's uh, text of his travels to Indochina, and he, um, she doesn't, couldn't read it, doesn't understand French, but she just um, created drawings on them very spontaneously and likes this idea of a kind of chance encounter too between the image that she applies to the text and the text itself. So they're kind of in dialogue, even though they don't really understand each other. Uh, so that also fascinated me that history, like Zanval's work, can be just a repository, a, 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 a kind of symbol or an emblem. It's there. We recognize its historical value, but we don't have to interpret it for that. We can find another meaning in it. And then finally, um, Hong Ngo, who is, uh, w was born in Hong Kong, uh, artist of Vietnamese descent, but she also, she now teaches at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And she's also very interested in history and uh, a work that she did also mines the archive. She went to libraries, she did research about Nguyen Thi Minh Hai, scanned uh, letters and documents, and then manipulated them. Here she did a, a kind of uh, etching of the, or uh, uh, etching of one of the letters and then uh, transcribed her comments on it as well. And so like uh, Tao, like Zen Ba, these are artists that interest me right now because of their uh, view of history and how they say as much about how we research these time periods uh, as much as they say something about you know, um, art making itself. So finally, lastly, are a couple of very recent publications. Um, one is a book that uh, Veronica Radulovic published called Don't Call It Art that is of her own archive. Uh, when she was lived in Vietnam in the 1990s and through 2000s as well, and published uh, a book that is, uh, captures uh, her time there and the, the, the objects and stories and things that she collected. And finally, my colleague Pamela Corey, who just hot off the press, published The City and Time, that is a, a fast, fabulous book about um, art in Ho Chi Minh City and Phnom Penh that uses very different methods than I've been telling you about today. She is much more focused on artworks themselves and the things that artists are saying, and it's also much more contemporary. So um, that's the trajectory kind of a Vietnamese art history and how it's written. And I'm happy to answer any questions that people have. Nora, what a wonderful talk. Thank you so much for that ride back in time, <laughs> because as I was looking at your slides and listening to you speak, I am so much reminded of my own journey of digging through whatever documents, reading materials,
websites that I could get my hand on to understand more about my own history, not just of art, but also the general, the general history of Vietnam through art, to artworks and to artists as well. Um, I could see that there are a lot of uh, questions on, okay. on Facebook, but <laughs> of course I'm going to take this yeah. opportunity to, uh, to ask you something. Um, I also just want to stress on um, the fact that I really much enjoy that you, you talk about the notion of hanging out with one another because I got to know you through your texts first and your books first and then we got to become friends and we started hanging out both online and offline right like this right here today and it is through your words and through your works that I am reminded of the friendship that artists had or artists still have right now and it is through us hanging out that their time is lived through me and also shared with me and I feel like with whatever it is that our generation of curators and writers now do we also carry all of that memories of hangout and it is through hangout that we will continue to to share that with with other people i mean today too with this talk we are literally simply yeah. just hanging out <laughs> uh, with our imagined community of audience but um yeah i guess my, my my question for you would be um it is often perceived that artists make artworks um writers write about artworks and historians situate and argue for the historical weight, the historical relevance of, of, of artwork. Um, do you think though, in the context of Vietnam, that that relationship between artworks and art history and artists and art historians, is that relationship always as straightforward? Or, or do you think it is a relationship where roles and responsibilities often, for better or for worse, uh, they often switch, overlap, intervene, but also influence one another. Yeah, no, I agree. And thank you for that. Thanks, Bill. Um, you know, it, these things are very fluid. And uh, I think that that's what I enjoy about Vietnamese art is it's constantly kind of shifting and morphing. You know, you think of art history or maybe a popular perception of art history is that there's a kind of canon, you know, that word is used where you go to a museum and you'll find these artists, established artists, and you, you situate them in time, you know, from medieval times or renaissance, whatever, and you don't think that, there, that there's any doubt, you know, that they deserve to be there because they're great artists. And you don't ask yourself the question, how they got there? How did they get into that museum? Who decided that that artist is better than another artist? You don't ask yourself that question. And we even do that in contemporary times. If you go to a contemporary museum in the West, you say, oh, of course that artist is there because that's the, you know, a great artist. But I feel like in Vietnam, we're still kind of figuring it out. Who is the important artist? <laughs> Who should be remembered in art history? So I saw that already in the 90s. It was already this question, fine, not fine. You know, who, who deserves to be there? But also, you're right, that it's, it's, it's an ecology or it's an environment that needs all of those components together. So it's not an art historian that said, OK, look, I'm going to set the record straight. These are the artists that we should all be paying attention to. Um, and nor is it that artists making artwork are, um, they're making, you know, they're, I don't know how to say it, they're making artwork collectively. They don't have sometimes their own individual identity very often, or that's what I find. So it's difficult for them to even say, this is my, my territory, you know, this is my turf. Uh, they work together, they hang out with each other, they talk to each other, and sometimes with the writers too, and they change, and, and so they, and, and, or they might change works, like I'm thinking, and this is not, you know, to be critical at all, on the contrary, but I see artists who change their style, or change their objects because, you know, someone else is doing it, which is something that in, the, in Western art historical writing you might say, oh, you know, they've, they've copied or they've, it's derivative of someone else or they kind of don't see, you know, they're not original. Uh, but here that doesn't matter so much. They don't, 
think about that so much. Yeah, yeah I, I, th I actually think that the, the fluidity in many ways helps to free us uh, from this uh, often expected and, and, and often also biased um, cultural, social, political framework of, of assessment and of inclusion that is put on us by some Western standards. And I think by not having this like standard approach to art making or art writing or art history, it, it frees us from having to to wear all of this burden on our shoulders. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. Whether it is for the better or for, for the worse, I think it is to be uh, yeah. discussed. Um, but yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, and it's interesting to see the trajectory of when, you know, this is why I, I continue to be interested in Vietnam as a subject, because you see this clear trajectory from artists who definitely were not paid attention to, nobody was paying attention even to Bu Xuân Phai outside of Vietnam until later, until way after he died. Uh, and, but to see the, the, the evolution of that mm -hmm. and uh, to see people actually becoming interested in what Vietnamese artists are doing, but always with a little bit of um, still, uh, it's an outside, outside mm -hmm. inside kind mm -hmm. of view. But, yeah. yeah. I think that's, uh, unfortunately, that is something, that it is a condition that, that we'll have to work with and work through. There's, there's no doubt about it. But I think it makes it ever more interesting. So I'm going to read some of the questions okay. that people have here uh, for you. Uh, there's this one here, that, which I think is fantastic. OK, so in your talk and also in your paper, the Southeast Asian art historian as ethnographer published in 2011, you foreground the need to pay attention and respect to the human aspect of writing art history through observation, interviews, and recordings of oral histories with living subjects. While this approach puts the lives and works of living local artists at the center, it may also bring about questions on the validity and valid validation of information. Uh, for example, how can we determine, <clears throat> excuse me, how can we determine the truthfulness of information? How can we fact check memories? Is it by comparing? Uh, and furthermore, by comparing it to whom or what, especially in a place where there exists no comparative framework for analyzing contemporary art history. Yeah, no, it's it, excellent. It, yeah. excellent question, in which I, <clears throat> I wrote that article specifically because I was also kind of double checking my own, the validity of my own methods of research because I found out that I had different information than what I had originally published or someone contradicted me and, and I begin to understand the shortcomings of that of that method and of course you know I, I, I keep referring back to you know Clifford Gear it's hanging out he never said it was a scientific method you know? <laughs> <laughs> so this is not science uh, but I think that I may have treated it as such, mm -hmm. and it's and the, the, for that I you know would correct myself. Like yes, because I of course found out that I've been told this, and then someone else says something else. But that's what's interesting about yeah. it too. And I and I and like what we were talking about before, that's the beauty of the fluidity of it. Then we shouldn't take it as a fact. And artists are absolutely allowed to say what they want yeah. about their work, and they're allowed to say something different to someone else. Yeah, I totally and then the burden that. is maybe on the researcher to how they present it, you know, how they present those things, mm -hmm. and um, and and you know, by extension, curators and so forth. Uh, and we we make mistakes. Mm -hmm. But then if we say we make a mistake, that means we believe that there is a truth somewhere, yeah. and, or there's the real story, and there's the, the other story. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm beginning to, or I'm inclined to say, there is not the real story, yeah. right? It's as valuable to hear someone you know, uh, speak uh, differently you know, or say something different. That said, I also believe that we need more information, and that we need archives. So I'm like going from one extreme to another, kind of in going from ethnography to archives. But the archive, in my view, is not 
what you say about art is there. It's the stuff itself. It's the material itself. It's the history itself. So that's extremely valuable. So the more we actually can collect that, the more closer we are to something that is less subjective, you know, and something that is not necessarily based on hearsay or gossip or stuff. It's, just, it's the material. And that's really interesting to have that. And I think that the reason why we don't have more of that is because in Vietnam, look at the history of Vietnam. Things got lost, destroyed, mm. rotted away in the humidity, poverty, you know, multiple factors made it, why, or the lack of necessity, why would people keep some of these things? But, you know, it also makes me think that maybe my ethnographic approach was also a kind of archive, you know, and I, and this is why it's interesting to see Veronica as kind of seeing it that way too, like who you met or the little bits and pieces of things that you collected, the drawings, the this, the photographs, become a kind of archive, even though I saw it as ethnography at first. Yeah. But I think that um, it's an excellent question that maybe other parts of the world, I don't think they grapple with this in quite the mm -hmm. same way. It is kind of unique to this part of the world to kind of there where things are in flux because art history as a discipline was not really valued in Southeast Asia until more recently. It's something that really was valued only in Europe and America. So now that we are accepting we have an art history here, it does exist, um, but it, it's normal that it's in flux still, mm -hmm. it's not really fully formed. Yeah. Yeah. The performativity. Yeah, of, exactly. Of the yeah, way. exactly. Yeah. Okay. So ready for yes. a, for another question? Um, okay. So there's one here. Could you share a little bit more more about how you triangulate, or do you find that unuseful? Contradicting narratives in an attempt to still write art history, however, admittedly contested. Hmm. <laughs> How do I, yeah, oh boy, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, I think by pointing out the shortcomings of certain narratives, you know, or being critical of certain narratives, that's how you kind of navigate this, or asking a lot of questions, and not being so factual. Like, I've, I'm adjusting, you know, I think art historians are like, Curator is an artist too. We're constantly adjusting our style or our methods or our craft. It's a craft. It's a. It's almost an art form in, its, yeah. in itself to write art history. You're writing, so you have to kind of adapt yourself to new new ways of thinking. And I think that uh, asking questions um, is just as valid as as anything. Mm -hmm. So you could question the validity of something in your own art historical writing. Mm. So that's how you kind of navigate some of the contradictions. Mm. Yeah. Um. Okay, so one more question. Uh, could you describe the dynamic between the dominant community in Vietnamese art scene and the underrepresented community, i.e. the minorities or other ethnicities, for example. What do you think is the effort needed to be made in order to validate cultural and or art practices that came from the latter communities? Since, like you said, there are still questions re regarding one's uh, legitimacy to be, appreciate, uh, to be appreciated in the public spaces. You're talking about like people from the highlands, yeah, those are minorities, so. or, yeah. Or maybe if, if we think about like artists um, from this from central Vietnam, yeah, or from smaller towns, for yeah, example, right? Yeah, yeah, and uh, of course, uh, I realize nobody, if someone might ask, okay, I only talked about Hanoi and it about <laughs> Saigon, but um, the. No, that's, that's, I mean, I think, again, that's a new method. The, the, the beauty of Pamela Corey's book is that she's asking different questions mm -hmm. than I did. And then she is focusing on a different set of artists but we, who, who are exploring different issues. And so we need someone to ask those questions. Okay, 
who are the artists in you know Hoi An mm. and what are they doing? I mean, I think that that's perfectly valid to do because someone may come up with a completely different perspective mm. on that. So here it sounds like okay, I'm following this center periphery paradigm of Vietnamese art. Hanoi is where the center is, right, and everything else is marginal. Um, I don't think that's the case at mm. all, but it's. I may have inadvertently perpetuated that, but why, what if we think completely differently? Like these are not marginal artists, or these are these are they have their own centers. There's a actually a research project in Hue going on, funded by um, Australia, the the Alpha Wood Foundation mm. or something, and that it was really trying to research what's happening in Hue and the history of Hue as an independent research site independent of the nation of Vietnam or Hanoi and everything. And that's fascinating to me because you could, you, you, you don't have to marginalize it. It doesn't have to be in relation to the rest of history. It can have yeah. its own history, yeah, separate, I, yeah. a kind of separate history. And um, I think that's what Pamela did a little bit with Ho Chi Minh City, just kind of not, not quite, but it's similar in that she just isolated it, but she didn't, call attention to its isolation, mm. because of course Saigon is not isolated, mm. but she didn't have to justify that she was separating it from Hanoi. Mm. Um, so I think you can do the same elsewhere. It mm. just, and again, these are methodological questions, like how are you going to approach something? Which, which lens are you going to view it from, and which questions are you going to ask about it? Yeah, which is why I think, you know, it's, 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 we, it's necessary that we have more and more writers and more yeah. people who who well who study art history and come up with different approaches. And also, art history in Vietnam, I think, particularly, could also be something that becomes of a a, a kind of a topic for an exhibition. It is through the medium of, of curated, curated exhibitions that you can also tap into. Uh, the fluidity, exactly, yeah. exactly the, the, the fluidity of information, of different um, alternating histories that were existing parallelly at the same time. Yeah. Um, we're running out of time, so I have just one more okay. question for you from, from uh, the audience. Okay, so throughout your journey as an art historian, what have been the advantages and disadvantages of applying an ethnographic approach to writing art history? What advice would you give to someone who may want to research or write about Vietnamese art history? Where should they start? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, art histories build on other art histories. This mm. is, you know, you're always in dialogue with, your, with what has been done before. Um, and I think that I had the great advantage of kind of having uh, nobody else writing it before me. <laughs> Now, that is nobody outside of Vietnam. Mm. I should I should clarify that mm. because of course you know Nguyen Quan had written yeah. his book and so forth. But there was no one outside of Vietnam that was interested in Vietnamese art. So I kind of felt like I had, like you say in French, carte blanche. Like I could just write pretty much what I want. That mm. I mean, it's not exactly true. But uh, but that that was freeing, but at the same time, a big challenge mm. because. I didn't have any other perspective mm. to kind of go against or counter or critique or argue with. I had to kind of write a straightforward narrative that was um, based on my own observations and so forth. So, so it's both an advantage and a disadvantage in that regard. So now the advantage of, you know, 30 years later, a young researcher in Vietnamese art, they have a lot more text that they can, they can look at. Now, Art history is written with artworks, first and foremost, to write about. But art history is also a field that relies on text, mm. because you're reading what someone else has written, but you're also reading maybe what artists have written, but you, you're always reading text, too. And it's a discipline that cannot exist in a vacuum, just on the artwork itself. It also is discourse, it's also theories, it's also interpretations. So I think for a young scholar right now, they, they have a lot to, of artworks to choose from, and they have a lot more art writing to choose from. Um, but they might, the challenge would be actually to find 
a pocket of Vietnamese art history that has not been written about now, because so much has been written. But I think that, for instance, there's not enough written about the South, mm. uh, for sure. There's not enough written about Hue, so mm -hmm. that's happening. Um, there's, you could go back in history and find, um, you could find contradictions, you could find um, artists that haven't been, you know, talked about enough. Uh, and I think that that's, that's going to be really rewarding because I think there's a lot to choose from. So my advice would be just poke around, read what's been written, and, and, and find something that that you like. Start <laughs> hanging out with us. And start hanging out. <laughs> Hang out. <Yeah>. Try it. <laughs> Once again, thank you okay. so much for okay. a wonderful no, afternoon. No, thank you, Bill. It's, yeah, it's always nice talking to you. A great honor yeah. to have you <laughs> thank here at the foundation with us. Thanks. Uh, to our lovely audience online, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, soon you will hear from us uh, regarding more information on our next exhibition and events. Uh, please, you can frequently check our website, our Facebook, or you can email us too. Uh, thanks again and goodbye.